Good morning and welcome to Coffee with Sister Jacinta. Today we are going to be continuing our journey, spiritual journey, through the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and we'll be looking at the Sacrament of Marriage. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And today we'll also invoke St. Zelie and St. Louis Martin, um, both of uh, them, um, well, they, they are a married couple who were the parents of St. Therese and um, her sisters, who I think almost all of them might be considered venerable. Um, and they have been um, raised to the altar because of the way in which they were able to keep God as a focus within their marriage and in their upbringing of their children. And so we really need their intercession today. All right, so we are on number 1612. The nuptial covenant between God and his people, Israel, had prepared the way for the new and everlasting covenant in which the Son of God, by becoming incarnate and giving his life, has united to himself in a certain way all mankind, saved by him, thus preparing for the wedding feast of the Lamb. Okay, and again, this is so beautiful, as we mentioned yesterday, the whole gift of the sacrament of marriage is a prefigurement of what we will all be participating in for all eternity, um, with that whole idea of the wedding feast of the Lamb. So it's always pointing towards this. And this is why our Lord has put such um, rules, okay, of um, about marriage that the, all the apostles sort of balked at, okay? because he is so faithful and he wishes us to be faithful and that is to be exemplified in our marriage here on earth okay in 1613 we read on the threshold of his public life jesus performed his first sign at his mother's request during a wedding feast the church attaches great importance to jesus's presence at the wedding at cana she sees in it the can confirmation of the goodness of marriage and the proclamation that thenceforth marriage will be an efficacious sign of Christ's presence. In his preaching, Jesus unequivocally taught the original meaning of the union of man and woman as the creator willed it. And from the beginning, permission given by Moses to divorce one's wife was a confession to the hardness of hearts. The matrimonial union of man and woman is indissoluble. God himself has determined it. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. But going back, okay, to that wedding feast, okay, and we have that being his first sign at his mother's request. I, I love looking at that because the wine had run out. And so, you know, like we could say that that wasn't, it was embarrassing. Okay, but no one was going to die, you know, in that situation. And, and Mary's concern and, and Jesus's um, abundant uh, generosity in his response. Sometimes in our relationships, it seems like we are the wells run dry. And, and so, you know, invoking our lady, okay, um, to renew that love, to renew that wine, okay, of happiness is not something that will meet with a hard heart, okay, but a, a mother's heart. And she could understand the awkwardness of that wedding feast, okay, at Cana and the wine running out. We can know that what's even more important would be that love, okay, in that marriage. And so invoking God um, in the midst of our marriage is something that we always want to do again and not to ever be afraid of asking Our Lady. In 1615, we read, this unequivocal insistence on the indissolubility of the marriage bond may have left some perplexed and could seem to be demand impossible to realize. However, 
Jesus has not placed on spouses a burden impossible to bear or too heavy, heavier than the law of Moses. And even before I go on, I, I've, if I was St. Peter's wife, okay, um, I think he would have gotten, um, he would have had to sleep in the doghouse, okay, because when our Lord mentions the indissolubility of marriage, he's like, well, who, then who should get married? <laughs> <laughs> All right. And um, but I love the fact that we had the realness of the apostles, that they could bulk at the heaviness, okay, that they saw. And yet with the grace of God, it can become any cross can become light. Um, and so, you know, the apostles, even though this was something that, you know, you saw them, their human response, they never denied, okay, uh, preaching it and practicing it. And, um, you know, they didn't uh, cater, okay, to anyone else, okay, balking at this particular requirement. So I think that's so beautiful, okay, to realize the, um, the adherence that the apostles had to a teaching that may not have been popular. By coming to restore the or original order of creation disturbed by sin, he himself gives the strength and the grace to live marriage in the new dimensions of the reign of God. It is by following Christ, renouncing themselves, and taking up their crosses that spouses will be able to receive the original meaning of marriage and live it with the help of Christ. This grace of Christian marriage is a fruit of Christ's cross and the source of all Christian life. And again, this is an area that is being, um, what do you call it? Mm, under uh, duress, we won't put it that way. Uh, the uh, Saint, well not Saint, but Lucia from Fatima said that this was the thing that was going to be attacked at this time period. Um, and, and so it is so important for us to pray for families and to pray as a couple. And especially, you know, if you could do that, not just at mass, Okay, but to really bring that into something daily. Um, you know, there's a family that prays together, stays together with a famous saying put um, out there in America by Father Patton um, or Peyton, I'm not sure how you say his last name there. And, um, but it is something that they had done studies for. And it has been shown again and again that the likelihood of being able to remain faithful is increased. I mean, I think it was in the 90 percent pile. Um, by those who pray together. So we really want to ask that of God and, um, and to remember that we need to put him always in the family. So it's not just that one day, okay, when we had the marry, uh, marriage ceremony, okay, um, and the sacrament given to us, but it's that living it out and remembering that that grace continually increases as we live out, living for the spouse, okay? It's a, a continual grace of marriage, just like that continual grace of the priesthood as they serve the, the uh, faithful. Um, so it's not just a one-time grace. But I think that's just really special and, and something that we really wanna draw upon. This is what the apostle Paul makes clear when he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, adding at once, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. This is a great mystery, and I mean in reference to Christ and the church. And I know, again, I always emphasize that that was what we saw at the baptism, okay, of Christ in the Jordan. Um, you know, that whole idea that his humanity and divinity okay, have been wed together okay, in Christ. And so when he goes to be baptized, he's taking all of humanity and he is now cleansing them okay, and allowing them to be completely dedicated to the Father. Um, you know, it, it's always referred to in the church and it is um, an amazing mystery and, and something that um, you know, her Holy Father of the past, um, Paul II, or St. John Paul II, mentioned to, to even give as a, a mystery of the rosary, to really contemplate, okay, the dignity through which Christ has brought us, okay, that oneness. And again, and that being symbolized in uh, the conjugal, conjugal act of marriage. 
Um, the entire Christian life bears the mark of the spousal love of Christ and the church. Already baptism, that entry into the people of God, is a nuptial mystery. It is, so to speak, the nuptial bath which preceded the wedding feast, uh, the wedding feast and the Eucharist. Christian marriage in its turn becomes an efficacious sign, the sacrament of the covenant of Christ and the church. Since it signifies and communicates grace, marriage between baptized persons is a true sacrament of the new covenant. All right, so now we go on to the virginity for the sake of the kingdom. We're on 1618. Christ is the center of all Christian life. The bond with him takes precedence over all other bonds, familial or social. From the very beginning of the church, there have been men and women who have renounced the great good of marriage to follow the lamb wherever he goes, to be intent on the things of the Lord, to seek to please him and to go out to meet the bridegroom who is coming. Christ himself has invited certain persons to follow him in this way of life, of which he remains the model. And we have this quote, for there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to receive this, let him receive it. And it's interesting to have this particular um, section here in the midst of marriage. But I think it's important because yesterday we had read that um, man, okay, was made, okay, as man and woman, okay? I mean, humanity. And, um, and so marriage is um, sort of just part of the makeup of mankind okay and yet we are in the midst of it we have those who are called to virginal life and this is not contrary okay to their um, nature okay um it we're not called to be selfish okay and just as um any married couple knows okay that that fruit of your marriage is when you are giving okay to yourself to your spouse okay in the thoughtfulness, in the small things, in the everyday um, sacrifices and acts of charity and um, sharing and an encouragement that goes on, okay, and even with children, okay, that whole idea of being a mother or a father, um, you know, it's not just um, physical, okay, because that's very small, okay, in the end, okay, it's very, very much about educating and nurturing and giving a good example and um, advising. So this is what's very important, okay, as one enters into a life that's dedicated to virginity, it's not about selfishness. It's not just about, you know, uh, convenience, because some could go into it without the reason why God would call them to that, um, because they don't want to have the burden of taking care of anyone but me, myself, and I. And this would not be, okay, a consecrated virginity. This virginity, okay, whether it's embraced by a man or a woman, is for the sake of the kingdom. It is to further, okay, um, his reign in their hearts and in the hearts of all. Okay, virginity for the sake of the kingdom of heaven is an unfolding of baptismal grace, a powerful sign of the supreme, supremacy of the bond with Christ and the ardent expectation of his return a sign which also recalls that marriage is a reality of this present age, which is passing away. Okay, so that whole idea, like, what is the sign of? But the fact that we are wed to Christ, okay? That's that, that's, so marriage is that sign here on earth. But when persons take that vow of virginity on earth, it's called an eschatological sign because that's what we're all called to, okay? We're all called to be the bride of Christ. Okay, and, and so it is, again, um, not, beautiful because they place this within looking at the sacrament of marriage. Both the sacrament of matrimony and virginity for the kingdom of God come from the Lord himself. It is he who gives them meaning and grants them the grace which is indispensable for living them out in conformity with his will. Esteem of virginity for the sake of the kingdom 
and the Christian understanding of marriage are inseparable and they reinforce each other. A quote, whoever denigrates marriage also diminishes the glory of virginity. Whoever praises it makes virginity more admirable and resplendent. What appears good only in comparison with evil would not be truly good. The most excellent good is something even better than what is admitted to be good. All right. And, um, and so that's sort of the definition when you're looking at virginity, okay? That is not um, that marriage is something evil, it's something good, okay? Virginity is seen as something uh, of a higher good because it's going to the ultimate end for which we all are called, which is that spousal relationship with our, with our God. Okay, the celebration of marriage. In the Latin rite, the celebration of marriage between two Catholic faithful normally takes place during Holy Mass because of the connection of all the sacraments with the Paschal mystery of Christ. In the Eucharist, the memorial of the new covenant is realized, the new covenant in which Christ has united himself forever to the church, his beloved bride, for whom he gave himself up. It is therefore fitting that the spouses should seal their consent to give themselves to each other through the offering of their own lives by uniting it to the offering of Christ for his church made present in the Eucharistic sacrifice and by receiving the Eucharist so that communicating in the same body and the same blood of Christ, they may form but one body in Christ. Okay, that is actually a really powerful paragraph. Okay, so that marriage ceremony is really um, encouraged, okay, to be within mass, okay? Um, that's where its normal place is placed because it is a symbol of what is taking place at every Eucharist, where Christ is giving his entire life, okay, his entire self to his bride okay, dying on the cross, okay, um, you know, it is, that's sort of like the marriage, but okay, that was what cleansed us, that is what made it possible, it took away, okay, the barrier that separated us from God, and, and so, you know, like, it is the most, you know, it is the act, okay, of that total gift, okay, and of us totally receiving, okay, in Holy Communion, Okay, so there's that beautiful oneness, that unity, okay, of a soul and spirit, okay, um, and, and so that marriage that we are having blessed, okay, um, that is to be that symbol, okay, and it defines its, um, its model, okay, in the sacrifice of the mix, you know, its entire giving of self. It is selfless, okay? It's about the other. It's about self-giving. It's better than the word selfless even um, because it's not, um, it's going towards another's, towards another's good, towards another's happiness. And it's not with, um, you know, thoughts about me, myself, and I. In as much as it is a sacramental action of sanctification, the liturgical celebration of marriage must be per se valid worthy and fruitful. It is therefore appropriate for the bride and groom to prepare themselves for the celebration of their marriage by receiving the sacrament of penance. According to the Latin tradition, the spouses as ministers of Christ's grace mutually confer upon each other the sacrament of matrimony by expressing their consent before the church. In the traditions of the Eastern churches, the priests, bishops and presbyters, are witnesses to the mutual consent given by the spouses. But for the validity of the sacrament, their blessing is also necessary, okay? So you have that marriage between the two spouses, okay? And that's why the priest will have them um, say, do you take so-and-so to be your lawfully wedded spouse or something like that, okay? And then for better, for good, for weak, for sickness and and health and whatever else. I mean, I'm not getting married, okay? <laughs> but, you know, it's beautiful, okay? 
And, um, and so there's this, this actual statements being witnessed to, and then it is blessed, okay? So you need both of those, okay, for that marriage, okay? And um, within the Catholic Church. Okay, and let's see, the various liturgies are abound in prayers of blessing and epiclesis, asking God's grace and blessing on the new couple, especially the bride. In the epiclesis of the sacrament, the spouses receive the Holy Spirit as the communion of love of Christ and the church. The Holy Spirit is the seal in their covenant, the ever available source of their love and strength to renew their fidelity. All right, now we have matrimonial consent. And this is an important area, okay, where again, um, sadly, we don't see sometimes people entering into marriage with that full consent. And um, it can um, hinder, okay, the graces of matrimony to even have taken place. So um, or the sacrament of, of, of matrimony to take place. So here we have here, the parties to be married, Mary, I'm sorry, the parties to a marriage covenant are a baptized man and woman, free to contract marriage, who freely express their consent. To be free means not being under constraint and not impeded by any natural or ecclesiastical law. Okay, so the church holds the exchange of consent between the spouses to be the indispensable element that makes the marriage. If consent is lacking, there is no marriage. The consent consists in a human act by which the partners mutually give themselves to each other. I take you to be my wife. I take you to be my husband. This consent that binds the spouses to each other finds its fulfillment in the two becoming one flesh. The consent must be an act of the will of each of the contracting parties free of coercion or grave external fear. No human power can substitute for this consent. If this freedom is lacking, the marriage is invalid. For this reason or for other reasons that render the marriage null and void, the church, after an examination of a situation by the competent ecclesial tribunal, can declare the nullity of a marriage, that is, that a marriage never existed. In this case, the contracting parties are free to marry, provided the natural obligations of previous unions are discharged. And again, this is an area where there is, um, there's so many things to be looked at, okay? Um, and I'm not, what do you call it? I'm not trained in that area, okay? So I don't feel like I should say too much on this area because I think that's where you know we have canon lawyers okay who study the ramifications and and, and the um, intricacies of this and again it is one that we see um, very often okay um, attacked okay or gone into with ignorance um, or with lies uh, or withholding um, true consent and, you know, sometimes it's words without reality being there. And, and so, um, you know, that's, again, a whole bag of worms, okay? We want to call it that, okay? But, you know, we just pray, pray for that gift of marriage, pray that we can enter it. I mean, the church has truly tried to um, safeguard this sacrament by making a six-month um, time period of waiting and then having pre-Cana classes, okay, okay, pre, okay, think of Cana, that was a wedding feast, okay, so we call them pre-Cana, and um, but it's really to help people to understand that that consent, okay, it has to be free, it has to be real, okay, it can't be, um, you know, a, a lying, it can't be a holding back, it can't be done out of a coercion, okay, um, my parents want me to, love, you know, to marry a particular person, or um, I'm doing it for other reasons, okay? Uh, fear of that I'll never find another person. I don't know. I mean, again, I'm not the person who studies this, so. <laughs> but we realize how important and what a gift it is that the church has taken um, a step back, okay? Because we could say, well, people didn't have to have the pre cana classes. They didn't have to wait six months. And some people can be very annoyed, but it is the church in her wisdom 
seeing that marriage is under attack and that many times that we're going into it with a certain amount of um of ignorance and um you know it therefore really helping a person to understand what it is that we are um binding ourselves to and the beauty of this sacrament and yet it's truly always a work just as it is work to remain a consecrated religious um you know there's there's no walk in life that doesn't have its crosses our lord said you know if you want to be a follower of mine you must take up your cross so um it is something that um you know when you hear people who are disgruntled about that waiting period let them know that the church it's because she cares okay and that she wants that marriage to be something that lasts okay till their dying breath and to be full of grace and um and the happiness that god intends for it and the holiness that god intends for it okay so for this reason or for other reasons that render the marriage null and void the church after an examination of the situation by the competent ecclesiastical tri tribunal <laughs> can declare the nullity of a marriage i mean it never took place okay all right, can't be a marriage that went bad that they can give um, an annulment to it, just so you know, okay? Even though we would love to, okay? Because there are some situations where that marriage was totally valid and it turned sour and you, you have great, great compassion for the spouse, but it doesn't make the marriage not a marriage, all right? Um, and that's why looking at the Old Testament and, and seeing how the Israelites, oh my goodness, how often... They broke their side of the covenant with God, okay? And God allowed for them to have the fruit of their choices, but he remained a faithful spouse awaiting their return, okay? And allowing them to be cleansed and, and to accept them again, all right? And it's that constancy of God that he cannot but be faithful, all right? Um, and so, you know, that in those cases, although our hearts go out to the person, okay, who is suffering uh, due to a marriage that has gone bad because of the terrible choices of maybe their other spouse, um, you know, we can't say that you can go ahead, you know, and say that that marriage is null and void, okay? If it had everything there that made it valid, the church can't say, can't dissolve it. Okay, because our Lord said that's impossible. The only thing they could do is say, maybe that marriage never took place. So they can examine that. But if it did, it is permanent. And so one has to beg God for the grace to remain faithful to that bond by no longer um, making one, you know, like, you know, keeping that celibacy, okay, that may be imposed on you because of the infidelity of your spouse. All right, so again, we're never saying that it's easy but we know that God understands. And that's why sometimes reading that Old Testament and seeing how often the Israelites fell away, that God's constant love, constant being there, all right, um, is a symbol of that marriage. Um, at the end of that, it says, in this case, the contracting parties are free to marry, provided the natural obligation of previous unions are discharged. The priest or deacon who assists at the celebration of a marriage receives the consent of the spouses in the name of the church and gives the blessing of the church, the presence of the church minister, and also the witnesses visibly expresses the fact that the marriage is an ecclesial reality. This is the reason why the church normally requires that the faithful contract marriage according to the ecclesiastical form. Several reasons converge to explain this requirement. First, Sacramental marriage is a liturgical act. It is therefore appropriate that it should be celebrated in the public liturgy of the church. Second, marriage introduces one into an ecclesial order and creates rights and duties in the church between the spouses and towards their children. Third, since marriage is a state of life in the church, certainty about it is necessary, hence the obligation to have witnesses. And fourth, the public character of the consent protects the I do once given and helps mm -hmm. the spouses to remain faithful to it. All right. And that is so true. You know, how often do you have um, a witness to something 
so that when another person wants to say, well, I never said that, you can be like, really? Let's ask so-and-so because they were there, okay? And we all have our human weaknesses, okay? So that public witness, okay, to live up to our word is there. Um, so that the I do of the spouses may be a free and responsible act. And so that marriage covenant may have solid and lasting human and Christian foundations. Preparation for marriage is of prime importance. The example and teaching given by parents and families remains the special form of this preparation. The role of pastors and of the Christian community as the family of God is indispensable for the transmission of the human and Christian values of marriage and family, and much more so in an era when many young people experience broken homes, which no longer sufficiently assure their in this initiation. Okay, so, you know, like normally, you know, you hear about people going to different um, schools or, or parishes and, and giving a vocation talk. Well, we normally don't give a vocation talk about marriage because it's where we live. We live within a family, okay? And we have the experience of a mother and father and children, okay? And rules and families and, and the practice of the faith. But um, the church is seeing more and more that sometimes that initiation that should be there is not there. Okay, so again, those pre k classes are to help to actually understand what is the role of a husband? What is the role of a wife? What is the role of a father? What is the role of a mother? Um, you know, what is your role within the church? So, you know, there, there is something that is so beautiful, okay, about the church taking the time to meet the needs of our time. It is imperative to give suitable and timely instruction to young people, above all in the hearts of their own families, about the dignity of marriage, love, its role, its exercise, so that having learned the value of chastity, they will be able at a suitable age to engage in honorable courtship and enter upon a marriage of their own. And I think we will close with that today, all right? And, um, and then we're gonna continue looking tomorrow um, or next week, okay, at mixed marriages and the disparity of cult. All right, so let us pray. Uh, Lord, we ask your blessing on our families. Um, if we are presently married, we're asking for that blessing on our marriage and our children, if you have indeed um, been blessed with such. And we ask that for those families that we know and that we don't know who are struggling, um, who are separated, um, who are going through some um, trials, we ask that your grace be there, that they be able to continually look at the model of you who have given your life um, for your spouse and that we would be willing to give ourselves completely for the good of the other and to be able to model for them unconditional love. And we ask this grace through the intercession of Our Lady who interceded at that first wedding feast at Cana that we meet Christ at. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.